Welcome back viewers, Eric the Car Guy. Thanks for tuning in today. On my left is the 2005 Honda Odyssey that is a fixing it forward project. And in this video, I plan to focus on the things that I mentioned in the introduction that I wanted to do under the hood. Things like the timing belt and water pump replacement. Um, I wanna do valve cover gaskets. I'm gonna replace the battery and the battery terminals, uh, the rear catalytic converter. Like I said, a lot of stuff. I'm not gonna go into specifics on a lot of this because I've covered it in other videos, but I'll put links to those videos down in the description. And if I find anything unique or interesting that I wanna share with you, well, I'll be doing that along the way. So, a lot of work to do, let's get started. Before I get too far into this, I know some of you commented to the last video about me breaking my pry bar. Fear not, I seem to have repaired it. I stuck it in a vise overnight with some Gorilla Glue, and so far it seems to be intact. We'll see how well it holds up. I plan to be removing the intake manifold so I can more easily access the valve covers, but you can probably see that there's a fair amount of dirt and <laughs> rat leavings and all that kind of thing in here. So I'm going to go over it with some compressed air and blow all this stuff off before I'm, I'm going to cover up the throttle body and do all that before I start my work. That way I don't introduce all this loose dirt down into the engine and possibly cause issues. Since I was planning on disconnecting the battery anyway, this is my shop battery, we'll call it. So I'm taking this back. I have a new battery to install. And I was able to find a battery hold down in my pile of Honda parts. So we'll be able to cover that also. And I have new battery terminals because you know I hate these. Before I start installing a bunch of new parts onto this engine, I want to assess its condition. And the main reason for that is you might remember in a previous episode that the rear catalytic converter had come apart internally and clogged up the exhaust. That didn't happen for no reason. Something caused it. And it could have been a misfire, it could have been burning oil, it could have been, well, any number of things which I'd like to know before I really dig in. My hope is that it was a bad spark plug and a lack of maintenance that brought us to that point and I can move on. But just to be safe, I wanna do a compression test. And if I find an issue, do a leak down test and make sure that this engine is in good condition before I start bolting a bunch of new parts on it. Well, it's crusty in there, but the EGR passages are clear. It's always nice when the gasket stays intact. First, going to inspect the coil packs for anything that looks like there might be voltage leaks. Well, that plug was in there very loose, like very loose, like I barely had to turn the ratchet. Also, barely in there. So I think somebody changed the plugs, but maybe didn't quite get them in there all the way. I have seen these plugs work loose and I've actually seen them pop out. I don't put anything on the threads when I install them. That one was the tightest one, but still wasn't quite to what I would call my standards. The plugs tell the story of what's happening in the combustion chamber. Looking at this plug, it looks like there's a little bit of goo on it and it's just been driven in and out of the shop. So that just may be a rich mixture. But as far as oil burning, there might be a tiny bit of residue there, residue there but I don't mind seeing Dunzo plugs. Here's the other one, more of the same. I like seeing consistency. I like seeing consistency a lot, and this is pretty consistent with the previous plug. This was the one that was really loose. It's a little more goopy than the other two, as far as like crud that's on it. Burning oil shows up as like this tan crusty stuff. This goopy stuff, mm maybe a little bit of unburned fuel. Given that these plugs look fairly new, they're not gonna tell me much. Um, what might have happened is there may have been a misfire and the plugs were replaced to address that. So that's kind of my hope. My hope is that something was done to correct this problem and they just didn't find the clog catalytic converters. We'll do the compression test just to be sure. Nothing I'm seeing indicates a real issue. This makes me happy that we're replacing the valve cover gaskets and tube seals. A little bit of oil on this one, but this is on the front bank. If I'd saw this on the rear bank, it might contribute to a misfire. That one doesn't look bad. Also not in there very well. And I'm just gonna do this now. Whenever you're working on these engines, these dipsticks are plastic and it's so easy to break the top off of them. Just remove it all together and get it out of the way. 
More of the same on the front. These were a little tighter than the rears. This one makes me glad I'm doing the valve cover gaskets. And I usually get comments on this, like somehow this oil is getting down into the combustion chamber. That can't happen. I mean, this thing is screwed down into the cylinder head here. So the oil stops here. It can't get passed into the combustion chamber. That cylinder is burning a little bit of oil. See that white crusty? That's burning oil. But that's on the front bank, not the rear bank. If I'd seen this on the rear bank, I'd be all over it, but it's front bank. So I'm like, eh. Anywho, let's do that compression test. I've installed a new battery. Interesting to find out that the terminals are on the other side of where they were, but it doesn't seem to be an issue. I believe I can make that work. Anyway, I have installed my uh, trigger the starter is down here and you might see that little red wire that's connected to the starter solenoid and to this trigger and to the positive battery cable. Pull the trigger and I can crank the engine. This way I don't have to worry about turning the key on or anything with any of the stuff connected. Uh, let's get started with this. Going to begin with, is that cylinder one? Yeah, I think that might be cylinder one. Let's see what this one gives us. That's quite good an engine with this many miles. I'm not particularly interested in doing a wet dry test. Really that just tells you what kind of shape the rings are in. On an engine with over you know 200,000 miles or close to it like this one has, I'm not as concerned about that. If I've got good compression numbers, which I feel I did there, I'm happy to walk away with that. Really what I'm looking for is consistency across the entire engine. Let's see what this one tells us. Doesn't get much more consistent than that. But this final cylinder back here has to tell us. Once again, bang on consistent. All seem to be 140 PSI back there. What does cylinder four have to tell us? Well, that's interesting. Even more in the front. Cylinder five. A little bit less, I'd call that 145. Our final contestant, cylinder number six. What do you got? Also 150-ish. Eric, why do the front cylinders have more compression than the rear cylinders? It's an excellent question and I think I have a simple explanation. You might remember when I removed the spark plugs from the front, they were uh, actually in all three, I had a little bit of oil residue, mostly in cylinder five and six. And I think what's happened during the course of us working here and removing the plugs is that oil leaked down into the cylinder, basically creating a wet compression test for the front. And that's further evidenced by this uh, oil residue on the end of my compression tester. So that's what I'm thinking is what happened. But given that all the cylinders are you know, really close, I, I think this engine is fine, especially given its mileage. And I believe I'm gonna press forward with it. I'm sure you wanna know, Eric, well, why don't you put a little oil in one of the rear cylinders and see what you get? Fine, I'll do it with one, but I'm not doing it with all three, just because of time. That's uh, gonna be a trick getting oil back there, but let me use my oil bottle and a vacuum line. Wet test, cylinder one. <laughs> Boom, there it is. I've seen enough. I think this engine is fine. I think what happened is this. I think it began to run poorly or whatever, and somebody went in and replaced the plugs, and that didn't happen too long ago, and that may be when the assessment that the engine was blown came up. I'm thinking there might have been a problem with those plugs. They might have been old and maybe causing that misfire. But we're here now and the engine seems all right. So, like I said, I'm gonna move forward with it. Something that I know that's gonna come up in the comments, because it has in the past, is about the VCM system or vehicle cylinder management, as I believe what Honda calls it. That system is designed to deactivate, I believe three cylinders at a time uh, in order to make the engine more efficient at cruising speeds and that type of thing. And there was actually a Honda technician who made comment to the video where I found the bad catalytic converter on this. It said I should watch out for things like oil control rings, which uh, can stop doing their job and cause the engine to burn oil and then thus ruining a catalytic converter like that. I'm not necessarily seeing that here, but I know somebody's gonna mention it. And they always ask me about deactivating that system. On my 2012, I have that system. I've never had an issue with it and I don't mess with things I don't have an issue with. So that's, that's my answer to that question. I took the opportunity to clean the throttle body. 
I also did a little cleaning here. You don't want to get too crazy by adding too much solvent into the engine. If you do, you could hydrostatically lock it up. So I didn't spend a whole lot of time with this. I did, however, go over to the intake manifold and spend a little time with it, trying to get it cleaned up and ready for reinstallation when the time comes. My next plan of attack is to do the rear valve cover gasket and spark plug well grommets. Uh, in order to do that, I need to get this harness up out of the way a little bit better. It's sort of trapped underneath the power steering pump here, and I need to remove that anyway to do the timing belt and water pump, so I'll probably do that. I have a new belt. Power steering fluid's leaking out, but I think it was over, well, I know it was overfilled, and how much do you want to bet it's not Honda fluid? Don't worry, I put some oil to ride down. Why is it that drop lights always seem to be facing up towards your face instead of what you're trying to see. All of that was to remove that fastener so that this harness can come up a little bit easier. That gives me the room that I want. This guy is going to continually be in the way. I just know it. So that should work better. If I take this hose off, I can take this whole pump assembly and reservoir out of the way. Believe me when I say there's plenty that's leaked out already. It's amazing how much doing away with that pump just opens everything up. I'm not looking forward to putting that back. Honestly, this looks like an engine that had its oil changed regularly. Now I'm going to see what I can do. The catalytic converter is right here. So I can get to the top two fasteners super easy now. Um, and then I can disconnect this O2 sensor, which I believe is the one I'm replacing. Knowing that I would be back to replace uh, that rear catalytic converter, I never really tightened any of this stuff down. So it should come apart fairly easy. And I've got a new one of these catalytic converters on the way. It's not here yet. Uh, that'll make access a lot easier. Might be able to get to those fasteners from up in here. With this stuff out of the way, it's also a good opportunity to clean off some of this oil residue. I realize I may be jumping around a bit here, but since I've got that front section of exhaust off of here, and I'm gonna be replacing this catalytic converter, why not remove this catalytic converter? But looking at these fasteners, it's like, hey, what fasteners? But none of that's getting saved. So I can literally just cut these off, burn these out with a torch, and I'm good to go. Well, that's not cool. Never a dull moment. Oh, of course. My oxygen just ran out. As fun as this was, it's over. The oxygen is empty, so. But I've been waiting for an excuse to get the big bottles, which I will do now, but not today. So, moving on. Now that O2 sensor wire is all the way up in there. In fact, it's clipped on up top by the uh, valve cover. So I'm gonna unclip that, but there's also a series of plastic clips that hold it in place that I'm gonna have to deal with as well. Sorry. <laughs> Stuck that right in your eye. I was like, why is stuff falling in my eyes? I'm like, oh yeah, forgot to put my safety glasses back on. Let's see if this guy can get to it. Oh, and I got the fastener. That was the hardest one. I usually try to get the hardest one first. This one, the stud came with it. Stud also came with that one, along with some spider webs. Looks like reinstalling it's going to be a challenge as three of the four studs came with the fasteners. We don't shy away from a challenge here now, do we? All right, are you mine now? Why, yes. Yes, you are. The primary of two sensors getting replaced. I'm reusing the secondary. Wasn't a code for that one.
Thank you for not making me have to get out my torch that doesn't have oxygen. For those of you that might have missed it, there's nothing in this catalytic converter. It's just a big old fat pipe. Here's the new converter. This is what it's supposed to look like inside. Here's the part number for the new converter. The new converter came with new studs, fasteners, and gaskets. I just decided to check real quick. They're actually the same studs as what was in there originally and uses the same type of fastener. Gonna reinstall the O2 sensor with some fresh anti-seize. And do the same with the new one. These are actually sockets designed to install studs. I'll put links in the description of tools and stuff that's relevant. Now for the real trick, trying to get this on there with only three studs. Actually, I've got an idea. As long as I have the tool out, I might as well uh, take these studs out so that I'll make installation of the converter that much easier. Perhaps some penetrating oil is in order. All I need is one. I don't want to try to force it because I'm without fire at the moment. If something goes wrong. Ugh. If none of these are successful, I may have to rethink my strategy. Although, all I need is one. Yeah, that's what I worry about. Sometimes this tool will damage threads, which is why I was trying to be as careful as possible. These might need a little cleaning up. These are eight by one, two, five. I don't necessarily need to use the tool to install the stud. Finger tight is fine. When you tighten the fastener, it'll tighten up the rest of the way. Ready for installation. Yeah, I know it's kind of weird. There aren't any individual runners. There's just that one big hole. The runners are actually inside the cylinder head, which if you could call them that. Start with the new gasket. Excellent, they're all started. I believe that's all of them. Get this O2 sensor back up where it belongs. I'm just gonna zip tie the sensor wire attachments since they broke. Can't do anything about this pipe until I get this catalytic converter off of here. Before I forget, I should probably reconnect this O2 sensor. Let's get this gasket swapped out. Baked in there a little bit. Not as bad as I would think. I've had to chisel these out before. Oh, awesome. Came out in one piece. I like that. I like that very much. <sighs> so there was some loose paint on this valve cover and I decided to knock it off before running it in through the parse washer because I didn't want to clog it up. And quite a bit came off. And some of you might suggest, hey Eric, put it in the sandblaster and then repaint it. I honestly don't want to take the time for that, especially for something that's going to be buried in the back of the engine that nobody's ever going to see. I'm more concerned with it being reliable, but it is something you can do if you choose to, but I'm just going to clean this up for now. Part number for valve cover gasket kit. I believe it's the same part number for front and rear, left and right, however you want to look at it. Problem, this is not the right valve cover gasket. I have learned some things and I've solved some problems. Now it's time to share. This is the correct part number for the rear cylinder head cover gasket on this Odyssey's engine. And it is somewhat unique and it's because of this notch right here that's cut out of the uh, head cover. That notch is for this VCM setup that's attached to this rear cylinder head only. The front cylinder head cover is just a normal cylinder head cover. Um, this system is what I talked about that is designed to turn off these rear three cylinders under given conditions to help improve fuel economy. And it's only found on this Odyssey in 2005, which I've learned is not just an EX, it's an EX-T, which I think is where this comes in because that's the only way the part number would come up for it. And I believe this year Odyssey is the first year that used that system, which 
further complicated things. So if you have a 2005 Odyssey EXT with the vehicle, vehicle cylinder management system on it, you're gonna need that cylinder head cover gasket. This kit that I already have will work just fine on the front valve cover gasket. The problem that I solved was that I finally stepped up to the big boy tanks for my oxyacetylene torch. The funny thing is, I'm gonna set this up now. I'm only out of oxygen. I still have some acetylene left. So I'm gonna have this giant tank here sitting next to that little bitty tank there until it runs out and then I switch over to this larger one. And here it is all put together. Now I'm gonna to go to Harbor Freight and get myself some for real ratchet straps to hold these in place. But I think this solves the problem. When I run out of acetylene, I'll just move up to the big tank. And I should be good for a while. Let's try this again, shall we? So much easier with a torch. I'm not sure exactly when that catalytic converter is going to show up, but at least now it's going to make it so much easier to install this short pipe that connects the two uh, cylinder banks together. And yeah, it'll just be an open pipe afterwards, but until I get the other catalytic converter, that's where I'm at. But this affords me the opportunity, which I just took, uh, to spray some more brake cleaner in here and try to clean some more of this gunk off. And I'm just going to continue to do that until it's, uh, well, until I'm satisfied. Now let's get moving on this gasket. And FYI, while I was looking for the part number for this gasket, I also looked at how much this valve cover was. Guess how much it was. Go on, guess. Almost $900. <laughs> so pray you never need a valve cover or get one from salvage. Don't get it from Honda. This is why I like using OE gaskets. I don't have to worry about them sort of fitting. They just fit. More expensive, yes. Hard to find, also yes, sometimes. But that just went right in. Voila. I'm gonna do one more thing before I install it. And that is I'm gonna put a couple of dabs of uh, Honda Bond on these little ends here, just small dabs. But I just remembered and saw and I forgot to switch these over, so I'm gonna do that real quick. That's it. Before I commit, I'm gonna make sure that the gasket is still in place. I dare say that was probably the most difficult rear valve cover gasket I've ever done on a J-Series. And it's because of that VCM thing. But this is interesting. You'll note that there's a lot more sludge buildup and stuff in this front cylinder head than in the rear cylinder head. And since we had that catalytic converter in the back that went bad, you know, I thought I was going to find this. But instead, I find it up front here. I do see this from time to time where one cylinder head looks like this and the other cylinder is all coked up and full of gunk like this. But it's usually the rear cylinder head. And I've attributed that to, you know, okay, there's more heat back there and perhaps it gets heat soaked more than the front does. But this defies that explanation. I really couldn't say. I think I'm gonna run some type of oil treatment through this um, when I do start it up and see if that can offer some relief to this issue. I just made another discovery. If you disconnect the connector going to the back of the alternator, it gives you a lot more room. I believe this is a part of the PCB system, and I almost think there's something going on here on account of I don't normally see all this gook, uh, which could explain if there was an issue with the PCB or positive crankcase ventilation system, uh, that could account for what I'm seeing. I will definitely be cleaning this out. The fact that that just came apart <laughs> while I was using it means I'm going to have to get another one. I'm going to stick it back in there temporarily just to close it off. So we'll have to get one of these, but it was ugly anyway. I don't, I don't mind replacing that. I'm going to get off the big chunks just like last time, clean everything up, put it back on. Presto! It's all clean. Uh, I reinstalled the PCV valve just temporarily to finger tight until I can get another one of these. Uh, the gaskets and everything have been installed. I also made sure that there was uh, solvent that flowed through this whole area underneath this cover. 
and made sure that it flowed through here and here and everywhere. So the PCB system should be working properly now. Incidentally, there are no corners on this to use any Honda Bond on. See what disconnecting that alternator connector did? I mean, I just swooped right in there. Just with doing the valve covers, it already looks better under here. This, this gasket was leaking pretty good. In fact, I think this is the culprit for all the oil that I saw underneath. I think what I'm gonna do now is uh, complete the timing belt and water pump. I've covered that in other videos, so I'm not gonna get the detail on that. We'll be back when we're done. Quickest timing belt and water pump replacement ever. You saw it here. <laughs> if you want more detail on that, linked in the description will be a video that goes over the details of timing belt and water pump replacement on a J Series V6. That said, there are a couple of notes. I was able to put the rest of the engine back together. I don't know if you saw, I think the camera cut out a little bit early. Uh, the intake manifold's been reinstalled. The spark plugs have been reinstalled. The coil packs have been reinstalled. Uh, throttle body's been reattached. I also uh, took the opportunity to reinstall the lower exhaust pipe, along with the old catalytic converter, which by the way, was starting to clog up. You can see in this shot, if you can't see cleanly through it and you see these little splotchy areas in it, it's restricted and it needs to be replaced. Anyway, that's on the way, but not here yet. I've loosely installed it up there just, well, so I don't have exhaust blowing everywhere underneath the vehicle while I bleed the cooling system out. Additionally, I've got a couple other things to show you. During the process of replacing the timing belt and water pump, I inspected the seals on the crankshaft and camshafts. I didn't find any of them to be leaking. They all looked dry. And in my experience, I'd rather leave that alone, especially if it's a Honda seal and not bother trying to replace it because sometimes I've seen replacing the seal actually causes a leak, especially if you're using aftermarket seals. So I just skipped that altogether and I feel totally fine in doing that. So I didn't replace the seals, but what I did replace was the side engine mount. And in my experience, the side engine mount on J series V6 is no matter what vehicle they're in, uh, tend to break. And this is somewhat typical of what I see. So I, I pretty much include an engine mount with a timing belt and water pump job. You're pretty much there anyway, and you basically have to remove it. Replacing with the new one isn't that big a deal. Here's the one that Anchor Industries was kind enough to send me and the part number for it. Sadly, I don't have that oil treatment yet. It's being sent to me, so I'm gonna wait for that to show up. However, I am gonna continue with the service and change the transmission fluid. Well, it looks like that hasn't been done in a while. You never quite get it all. If you wanna change it all, change it three times after running it for a little bit in between each time. And that should get most of it. Put new fluid in. There's that plug right there that needs to be removed at 17 millimeter. Before I go and try and break that plug loose, I realized I'd be swinging the ratchet around in here and I could potentially knock my hood prop down and bring the hood down on my head. And that hurts, I know from personal experience. Now let's do this. Okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought, which makes me nervous. I never wanna see anything but Honda automatic transmission fluid and a Honda automatic transmission. Judging by the color of what I saw coming out of here and the fact that that was loose, I suspect somebody changed it with regular transmission fluid at some point. But until I can get it on the road and feel how it's shifting, I don't really know much. After that, all you need is a clean funnel and about three and a half quarts. This is obviously much easier without this air snorkel in the way, which I have ordered one of these and it's on its way. It's DW1 these days. 
Now the way you're supposed to check this is on level ground with the engine hot. I'm just gonna do a quick preliminary check. Make sure that it's level. They're as level as I can get it. And after I take it out for the first test drive, I'll recheck it, yeah. That says to me about a half quart more. Between these two dots is only a half a quart. I think I'm right where I wanna be. But once again, I'm gonna start it up, run it, get it hot, and then recheck it. Can't forget about our power steering fluid. I'm also using Honda fluid for this. This will also have to be rechecked after it gets warm. And since we're in the neighborhood, almost all of it. Last but not least, some coolant. And no matter what year Honda, like the older Hondas use green coolant, this is the newer blue stuff. I've been using the blue stuff in everything. You can, it is interchangeable with the green stuff, but the blue stuff, I find less issues with radiators leaking. In fact, they're almost non-existent since I started using this, which is one of the reasons I switched to it. Somehow, I almost forgot about our battery. I don't think it would start without it. While I'm here, let's take care of these battery terminals. Here are the new terminals that I've chosen. They were about 12 bucks. These other ones, 99 cents, if not cheaper. But I'm gonna say you get what you pay for. I'll link these in the description, by the way, but they came with plastic covers and everything. You can usually find these at like places that do pro audio. Sometimes you even find these at the auto parts store. Uh, the big one I believe goes on positive and the small one goes on negative. They both have different diameters. I like these because they came with that a little collar on the inside that acts like a spacer. Sometimes I've found that that's required. Less corrosion than I thought I would see. Still, Bye-bye. That was the sound of it going in the garbage. I'm not trying to cut with these. I'm just trying to find that groove so I can pull it through. I don't want to risk losing any strands if I can help it. it might be trying to time to change my razor blade though. There we are. It's just a wire brush. So what's the best conductive metal? Anyone? You think it's gold? It's actually silver. I dare say that's a lot better than what it used to be. Now for the ground. There. Now I'm gonna make some spacers for this guy. Be right back. Halfway through uh, modifying those J bolts, I remembered that I forgot to get the battery cover, which I took it out and reinstalled that. Uh, also, the approach that I took with these J bolts was a little bit different. I cut them a little bit shorter, but then I threaded things down a little bit farther. I believe they're going to work just fine. Anyway, let's see if my work paid off. That battery is secure with good connections. With that taken care of, all that's left is to start it up and bleed the cooling system. Let's see if it still works, shall we? I expected that exhaust leak. That catalytic converter is not completely connected. Let's back it out so that we can get the cooling system bled out. No leaks other than a little water from the exhaust. Now, since this is drive-by wire, I've got to sit inside the, the car to rev it up. I don't see the fans on yet, but I do have heat. And it runs really smooth, but the check engine light's on. I'm going to pull it in and get a look at that. I would like to see the cooling fans kick on, though. All right. Well, let me turn the air conditioning on and see if that turns the fans on. It's not really getting hot enough. It's a cold day. Yep, they're working now. This is interesting. So same sensor, uh, bank two, sensor one, which, okay, I'm an idiot. I figured it out. So I have the banks wrong. In my haste, I made a mistake. And I suppose that's something that often happens. The way the J-Series cylinders are numbered, they are numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. Bank one. Bank two, I replaced that O2 sensor 
I need to replace this one. My bad. Uh, so that's not going to be that difficult. I'll just order that and pull that up. You can see it's like right there, easy to get to. Thankfully, it's not that one. So bank one, bank two. This is actually bank two. So that's where I messed up. Sadly, I'm going to have to call it here. I have to bring in another vehicle to work on it. But we've made great progress on the Odyssey today. A lot of the stuff under the hood has been taken care of. I will order that O2 sensor. I will, the catalytic converter's on its way and I will install that in the next video. I'll keep you up to speed on everything. This is gonna be episodic. It's, there was a lot of work to do on this van. There's still a bit of work to do yet. And this is episode three, I believe. I hope you're enjoying the series. I'm looking forward to putting this in the hands of someone who needs it when I'm done with all this work, but I'm enjoying bringing this thing back to life. It's kind of fun and I hope you're enjoying the videos. I'll put links in the description to tools, parts, additional information, including a link to ericthecarguy.com if you have automotive questions not covered in this video. Other than that, thank you so much for watching today. Be safe, have fun, stay dirty. I'll see you next time. Oh.